Thank you. Uh, welcome back after lunch. We'll try to be entertaining. Uh, I don't know if we get entertaining enough to overcome uh, lunch, but we'll try. Uh, so this is Housing Development 101, Navigating Affordable Housing Development in Oregon, Part 3. That's where you meant to be. Uh, my name is Tracy Manning. I am the Executive Director of Housing Development Center. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so part three, uh, we, so in part one was, are you sure you want to do this anyway? And feasibility. Part two was, okay, you want to do this to trying to pull all the money and team members and, uh, information together. So part three says the word closing, which may or may not make sense. So that means you've got all the money, you've got all the people, you've got a design, we're going to start construction. So today we're going from construction through uh, uh, leasing it up and owning and operating the darn thing. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, what we will not be talking much about today, uh, just because we had to draw some lines, is some really important things like um, preserving existing housing, housing that isn't already um, affordable, I'm not going to be doing super deep dive, technical deep dives. This is 101. We love doing that, though. So if you want to do that afterward, come up and talk to us. We'd love that. Uh, and we're not going a lot into partnerships, which is really important in our work. But just, again, we have a lot of experience in it if it's something you want to talk about later. Uh, so what this is, this is uh, affordable housing. Uh, new construction is kind of our generic typical that we're talking about. And in this session specifically, ooh, uh, next slide. Uh, it's the problem with having them in front of you. Uh, we're going to identify and refine the strategies to keep projects on schedule, which often also means on budget, during construction, during lease up, super duper tricky, uh, and um, setting that course for smooth operations moving forward. So understanding construction period challenges and opportunities, strategies for efficient and successful lease up and operations, affordable housing resources and best practices, and uh, professional connections in the industry. Okay, next slide. So, uh, icebreaker, who here did not attend, did not attend sessions one and two? It was your first session. Sweet. Okay, good. Some folks. So we'll do the thing again. Um, uh, so who here is a developer? You self-identify. There's no quiz for that. Um, resident and supportive services staff. Mary, you can just keep raising your hand. It's fine. <laughs> All the hats. Yes, you get to raise one hand for each hat. Uh, board members. And let's do board members and executive team, executive staff, self-identified. Good. Okay, that's great. Nice mix. Um, asset or property manager? <laughs> KT just goes out and recruits. Like, um... Okay, something else, not yet named. What, and what are you... Funders, good. Funders, good. This is super. We give you a crown. What are you? Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> One more. Who else is in the house? Contractor. Okay. So where are like contractor, architect, environmental, our construction period folks? Good. Because we're going to be talking all about you. <laughs> and then who in here? Uh, own, already owns affordable housing or represents an organization that does. Okay. All right. Some yes, some no. Excellent. Uh, next slide. So uh, going to go through this quickly because some of you have heard this before. This is our credibility slide. Um, so we are the Housing Development Center. We're a nonprofit based in Oregon. Um, this is our 30-year birthday. Started in 1993, 
Um, our 21 staff uh, are divided in uh, three major uh, areas of support. Um, we've got a 15 person development team. So what we do is support nonprofits and housing authorities in Oregon and Washington in, uh, to develop housing uh, to serve their communities. Um, we bring technical expertise to help you create your vision for what that housing should be. You know your communities uh, that you need your mission and what you're trying to serve. Our mission is centering those who have been historically oppressed. Uh, we collaborate with our partners to envision, develop, and sustain affordable homes and community places. That sustain word is about uh, what our three-person asset management team does, and they are uh, part two of the show today, plus the next session. Um, development gets a lot of attention. Uh, maybe it's the sexier part, but keeping the building serving its purpose, and housing people in our community for 99 years, that's the hard part. <laughs> and so um, that's what we'll be spending a chunk of today talking about. And then uh, HDC also has a small uh, CDFI. We do some lending to support uh, folks during development, pre-development lending, that kind of thing. So um, we, we, over our 30 years, have helped develop over 8,000 units, 300,000 square feet of community space, like health centers, that kind of thing that support the housing. Um, and uh, we've got a lending fund of about $3 million. So I am shortly going to pass it on. Just wanted to let you know our format today. Um, we will take questions throughout. Um, we're going to try to use these microphones or repeat questions because we've got some folks on Zoom. And then there's a big chunk of time for questions at the end as well. And so without further ado, next, oh, I didn't know that slide was in there. Did I know that slide was in there? I did know that slide was in there. Darn it. Okay. Uh, so next slide, and I will pass it off to Julie. I'll be remembered to. All right. I'm Julie Brooks. For those uh, that I have not yet met, um, for those I have met, welcome back. Uh, I serve as a director of real estate development at HDC uh, with my colleague, Travis. Uh, we work with our development team um, and provide those connections between the architecture, contractor, owner, and then the funder, um, the uh, all the, the lender, investor, and that team. So um, my expertise is more in the construction side and um, the architecture side. So I'm going to take a little bit of time and talk about that construction period. Um, so we, in our session two, in our session one, we envisioned the project and talked about, I can't see anybody. I, I need these for reading, but I can't see any of you. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so in our first session, we talked about envisioning the project. Uh, who are we going to serve? Uh, how are we going to serve them? What does the building look like? In our second session, we talked about the design process and, and solving as many of those tricky questions as we can possibly do. And now we're going to take what in my day was a two-dimensional set of drawings, but now they're designing in three dimensions. But it's still uh, an abstracted version of a building, and we're going to build it into three dimensions that we can all inhabit and walk through. And so in that process, there will be misses, there will be mistakes, there will be things that were not conceived of. And so our job uh, in working with the contractor and the architect is how do we, how do we solve for those misses? Uh, and we preserve our construction budget and we keep on schedule and we get residents moved in uh, according to their intention. So a lot of it is uh, through meetings, 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 um, conversations, conversations, conversations. This is where that team that you've built in that very first section is so important. So much of what we do is built off of trust uh, and good conversations. Um, so 
when a challenge comes up on site, a lot of uh, we have to get, a, we'll get additional costs, we'll get additional proposals. We're managing the con what's called the construction contingency. Um, those items will be paid for out of a set aside budget that we looked at in the session two. Um, and as construction goes on, we need to make sure that our percentage of extra costs is not exceeding what we're putting out. And if it's and if it's not, then that's how we bring in the add back list. So that wish list that you guys have set up, so we keep those priorities. There will be hopefully opportunities that we can bring those in uh, through the add back list. During construction, we will also be working hard to track and build relationships with those uh, minority women emerging and veteran owned businesses. And this is a lot of the kind of relationship building work that we're doing, that our contractors are doing. Uh, the There are different jurisdictions will have different requirements for what they want to see for participation and your organization may have its own goals um, that exceed what the requirements are um, so we're tracking that uh, there are also a number of owner uh, owner contracted consultants that the owner will need to be managing during this construction process. Those include um, different inspectors. So the structural special inspections, the envelope, and I was talking about that before. So you'll may want to make sure that your siding and windows and flashing are all being constructed uh, appropriately. You might have different environmental uh, engineers coming in. Your sustainability, the, the entity that is helping you uh, manage the sustainability certification will be coming in to test. And, and those are all things that the owner will be managing with the contractor. Uh, and then the draw processes, uh, you'll be getting monthly draws uh, from the contractor that you'll want to evaluate, make sure that the construction is according to the status of what they're drawing against. And you're coordinating with your finance team to make sure that the, the budget is meeting the needs. Um, you're working with accounting, construction, finance, um, and you're constantly uh, making sure that the budget is meeting everybody's um, expectations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so the beyond cost schedule, schedule, schedule <laughs> is the most important thing. Making sure that if there are any uh, misses and glitches that we're able to accommodate that there may be we may need to look in different alternative ways of managing that process. We need to make sure that the schedule is um, is coordinated and we start towards the end of the project, we start bringing in our asset management and property management team um, to, uh, to start to line out the marketing efforts and then understanding what lease up is going to look like, uh, what the compliance requirements are for the different types of units that you might be bringing online. I'm working on a project right now that is in that process of lease up. It's a phased project. Uh, we started bringing in our property management team six months before we were leasing up our first unit. And that allowed us to really get out to our partners uh, who were providing residents that were going to be potentially living at the new housing units. Um, starting to get things lined up like, uh, I would like to say mail delivery, but we've had residents who have lived in this facility now for three months who still have to go to the post, post office to get their mail. Um, but we are getting mail delivery, trash, laundry, all this other things assembled uh, for a project uh, so that they can move in and have um, their systems accommodated. Um, we're then doing our uh, punch list. So at the end of the project, 
the architect will come through and review and make sure that the buildings have been constructed according to their plans, finding any last uh, things that need to get revised and making sure that the, the unit is clean and ready to go. Um, and so that is also a time when there needs to be close coordination between uh, the contractor, the architect, and then property management uh, on, on what that looks like. Um, so yes, please. Oh. So I want to jump in real quick and just emphasize a little bit the schedule, schedule, schedule. Uh, and that's not only from the standpoint of construction and lease up and setting the expectations appropriately for your property managers and your residents about when they can move in. Um, but with affordable housing, there's also some really, really critical schedule milestones for your lenders and your investors and your public funders in terms of uh, the guarantees that you've made them about when they'll when you'll deliver those units um, for your low income housing tax credit investor that impacts the amount of tax credit that they get, uh, which is why they invested in your project in the first place. Uh, and so uh, when your project is delayed or if your project is delayed, which hopefully it isn't, um, that potentially has impacts there and it has to do with the agreements that you executed prior to closing on all of your financing. So understanding what those impacts are, managing to those impacts and understanding uh, how you're going to mitigate those is really important. Um, in the last session, one of the other things that we talked about as well was really around construction interest, which has just been uh, has just been a real bummer uh, to put it lightly uh, for projects lately, uh, and uh, and projects that finished on time uh, had completely different impacts from that than projects that took longer uh, to complete or took longer to lease up. It's really been a big deal on projects. So that schedule thing just can't be emphasized enough. And so along those lines, uh, building on what Travis said, that example that I told you, the project that we're working on right now, uh, we brought property management in six months prior. We had a very clear marketing strategy. We reached out to our partners. Well, construction, because of things that are going on with PGE and some uh, material delays, construction was two months behind schedule. But because of that careful coordination with property management and some very tricky conversations with our architect and contractor, we were able to exceed, we are going to end up exceeding our schedule by two months. So the project is a phased project. Um, the, 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 the first phase was supposed to come online in February. It came online in April. The second project was, or the second phase was supposed to come in, I think April or May, and it came in in June or July. And the, the third phase is supposed to come in in September. It's coming in in September and our all of our units will be leased up two months ahead of schedule. And that is because of these careful coordination meetings with all of this team and this, uh, the ability for the architect to get in early and do their punch list to the, for the contractor to jump in and make things, get things fixed and do things a little different. And then our property management team, um, was following right behind the contractor, getting residents moved in as quickly as they could. Um, and it all was because of this careful coordination with each other. Um, uh, so understanding, and, and it's important too, to understand, next slide. sorry, next slide. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. But I could do next slide on my little computer. Um, so, uh, it's important too, to know what the critical financial impacts are, uh, because, some of some of the milestones um, might not be as critical. I don't know how this. It's uh, you may think that you're working towards a deadline, um, 
And there is one deadline that is really important for tax credits or um, for some funding stream. And there may be another deadline that may be a little arbitrary. And so again, it's important to understand what are the critical things and drive your folks to those uh, and give on others. Um, um, so I think I'm gonna pass it off to you now. Sorry. Okay. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I'm seriously fighting this crowd with food coma right now. There's like some serious low energy. I wish it was like 50 degrees in here. Uh, so I'll do my best. I'm also obsessing about the fact that that box has a word that's not in it at the bottom and it's absolutely totally distracting. So, uh, no, that was me. I think that was me. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. What we're doing is we're starting to talk about lease up. Here's the thing. This is a 101 class. I could talk an entire day about lease up. I'm going to be talking in our next session about lease up uh, with a really amazing team that completely nailed their lease up. And it, it's amazing. So I hope that you are able to come to that. All right. I'm Kimberly Taylor. Uh, I'm the director of asset management at Housing Development Center. Um, and I've been at HTC doing uh, training and technical assistance for our clients um, since 2010. Uh, and so thank you for that, because I would have forgotten. Okay, so diving in, um, coordination, development team, asset management, property management, services folks, all of that integration, really, really, really important. Integration, coordination, lots of communication. Um, so I, I put a bullet in here about pre-leasing versus completion timing. Uh, prior to being at HTC, I was on the tax credit investor side. And a famous story that I tell in these situations is when there was a planned co construction completion, everyone started pre-leasing the units. Property management started getting residents to fill out all their paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork, by the way, if you didn't know that. Um, and they did all the, it was a hundred and I think 180 units. They did all their paperwork, got everybody pre-leased. And then there were construction delays because they started too soon. All the paperwork was outdated. You have a 120 day period that that paperwork is good and then it's stale and you have to start all over again. So they started the entire process over again. So it's really, really important to kind of work with your development team to understand, well, there's a chance we might be a little bit delayed. I think the sweet spot is starting at like 60 days out because the 120 day mark is beyond that is stale. 30 days is a little cutting it a little close. So just know that construction completion and buildings being online, absolutely that date has a massive impact on whether or not you are able to move folks in and that their paperwork is still good. Um, okay. <laughs> Team turnover. Sorry. Uh, that is just the reality of the situation right now. We are in this industry, uh, maybe others too, but especially in ours, there's a lot of revolving door people. So either folks going from one organization to another, or what we're seeing is such intense burnout that folks are like, peace out. I'm going to go pour beers for a while because I just can't do this anymore. And so team turnover is a very real thing. Another fun story. I did a training with uh, property management and services folks and asset management folks for a project. I did that same training four different times because the teams turned over that many times over like a two year period. Um, it's real, it's costly. Training and education is absolutely critical for a successful lease up. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about that again in the next session, but um, also a plug for the property and asset management work group. I see a lot of faces that I know in here. We have an asset management work group that HTC facilitates. We meet uh, once a month, the second Wednesday of every month. It's a group of asset managers from all over the state. We get on online on Zoom and we talk shop. We do trainings. We share 
resources, ideas, brainstorm things. So if you want information about that and how to get on our list, go to HTC's table. There's a flyer about POMLOG, the unfortunate acronym. Uh, okay. Uh, training and capacity, uh, rent setting and marketing. Um, you just would think like rent setting, sure. Like we know what our maximum rents are for hopefully, uh, you know what your maximum rents are for your project. It's so much trickier than that. There's market consideration. There's situations now where the maximum allowable rent for the percentages that are on your project, 60%, 50%, 30%, whatever it is, the maximum allowable rents for those percentages are actually higher than the market rate. And that is actually true in a number of areas in Oregon. Um, so sometimes asking for that maximum allowable rent isn't possible because you won't be able to rent your units. But then your development team is going to be like, but wait a second, we modeled it that you were gonna charge maximum rents. So what are we gonna do? That's again, the collaboration coordination piece where you really have to strategize. Again, we're gonna be talking about that in the session after this one. Um, definitions are a big thing. We were actually just having a conversation during lunch about the definitions of placed in service, which again, this is a 101 class, but we were talking about when does a building, when is a building deemed like placed in service where you can start moving folks in? Well, there's a temporary certificate of occupancy, there's substantial completion, there's certificate of occupancy, placed in service. There's a lot of definitions of things and different folks define those things slightly. Can It can vary. The definitions can vary. So it's just important, again, to not, there's also a lot of assumptions that happen in our group. Uh, in our industry, when we're working on projects, oh, well, certainly the developer knows about that or has taken care of that, or certainly asset management understands that piece. And don't assume, don't assume. It's all about communication, like we were like we've been saying. It's like over communicate. You're going to see multiple slides in this session that you're also going to see in the session after this one, just because it's the more information you have, it's it the better. Um, Okay. And then uh, insurance claim, well, insurance is such a majorly hot topic right now, but insurance claims on your existing portfolio of housing can drive up the costs of insurance for your new project. Um, and just insurance rates in general are going up. Um, so uh, these are all things that will impact your project's ability to stabilize, which again, we'll talk about in a few slides and also the next session. Anything to add, anyone? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, so project stabilization, again, 101, is when your project is essentially leased up, I think it's you can be at 95% occupancy, and you start three consecutive months of what's called stabilized occupancy, which basically is demonstrating to the funder, lender, investor in your deal that your project is going to operate the way that you said it would. S yes. Is it fair to say that that's not a stabilized occupancy, but a stabilized operation? Yes. Uh, stabilized occupancy and stabilized operations. It's both. And operations, and that means financial. That means like you're collecting the revenue, the rent from the folks who are living there, your brand new residents, and you have expenses that are coming in and you're meeting those debt service coverage ratios, the debt service coverage ratio that you promised your lender. Um, in the old days, and again, we're going to be talking about this in our next session. I keep saying that I sound like a broken record, but we are, we're deep diving into that. Um, I think in the old days, stabilization was pretty simple. We, uh, you know, aimed high. There was revenue. Expenses were pretty light. It wasn't a big deal. What we're seeing now is, sorry to use the word unprecedented, but it's true. Um, we, and I don't know, maybe, well, I won't ask this question because people don't usually want to name it, but uh, we are seeing projects that aren't able to stabilize uh, in those three months. Um, and a lot of that, it's a lot, it, a lot of things contribute to that. But one big one is that expenses are so much higher than they were when the project was modeled. Um, so when the development was put together, which was like two or even three years ago, 
you sort of did this. Oh yeah, expenses will go up three, four, five percent, maybe five five percent on the way high end. We're seeing expenses seven, eight percent, in some cases even more, um, and certain line items that are through the roof. Insurance like thirty percent, twenty five, thirty percent higher. It just blows your budget completely out of the water and projects are having a hard time meeting that debt service coverage ratio for stabilization. Um, lots more to say about that, but that's what stabilization is um, and requires a lot of coordination uh, again with asset and property management and accounting. Accounting is critical uh, for, for this piece. Yes. If uh, So for anybody that's not as familiar when KT's talking about or Kimberly's talking about debt service coverage ratio in uh, more simplified terms, when you collect all of the rent and all of the income from the project, you subtract all of the expenses that the project pays on a monthly basis, and you subtract the amount of your loan payments every month, that debt coverage ratio essentially reflects that cushion or that little bit of extra money that's left after all of that. Thank you. Yeah, I probably should have gone into that a little bit. Um, and there is a minimum that you have to hit, uh, a minimum coverage ratio that you have to hit. And a lot of folks are not able to get to that ratio. That's what we're talking about. Um, and then uh, closing documentation and document retention. So folks who know me and have been in trainings with me before, there is this thing called a compliance chart. Uh, which is essentially a summary of the requirements for that project. So you have, and we talked about in previous sessions about the different funding layers, the more funding sources you have in a project, the more compliance layering there is. That means the more requirements that you're going to have to uh, follow every, no money, even grants, they're, they're not free. They come with reporting requirements. They come with usually unit set aside requirements, um, whether it's income and rent limits or a special population that that funder wants to see living in that project. It's a lot to navigate. And the more expensive it is to do development, which is just getting more expensive, the more money you're going to have to go out and find. And every source of funding that you get comes with that layer of compliance where there's reporting every year or every quarter. There's um, paperwork that has to be completed by the residents. Like property management's on the ground doing all of that. And it's a tremendous amount of work. So um, it's important to have some kind of summary. We have templates uh, that help do that, um, that basically take all of that information and summarize it so that everybody, the development team, asset management, property management, they all have all of those requirements all in one place. Um, resident training on, yes, question. Who wants to take that one? Uh, so the, uh, at least when we're talking about this project stabilization, the consequence of that typically is that you can't convert from your construction loan to the project's permanent loan. Uh, and that carries a few risks and challenges and problems with it. Um, uh, in this current environment, construction inter or interest rates in general, but typically your construction loan, uh, typically construction loans have been a floating rate. So they're based on um, some federal or other metric. Uh, and as interest rates have gone up nationally over the past two years, uh, where they're at right now is so far in excess of what we imagined they would be two years ago when we started on projects that the longer it takes you to stabilize and, and achieve that conversion, the more interest that you're paying. And we're seeing situations where owners are having to pay that out of their own pockets right now because we have expended all of the project sources uh, and all of the contingency and all the other things that we've had. Um, there are some other more serious um, sort of cliffs that you can potentially hit to if it takes you, you know, if it takes you just a little bit longer, there's some issues and penalties. If it takes you a lot longer, um, there are potentially some even more extreme cliffs in terms of uh, uh, funding commitments that you legally have agreed to in your contracts for those fundings that you haven't met. And that really depends on kind of what 
penalties are established in whether it's your loan agreement or your public funder or with your tax credit investor. Um, but it but it can tank your project or cost a lot of money um, in the worst case scenarios. Yeah, for sure. And I I think also um, it takes a village. I mean, to do this from start to finish, but especially what we're seeing now with the stabilization issues that projects are having, it takes everyone at the table to really strategize about how to get the numbers where they need to be and who needs to help do that. So it's a lot of coordination. Um, it's just tougher than it's ever been to to hit those marks, uh, just with the environment that as it is now. Um, resident training on unit and property specifics. So I I put this in here because we have a lot of projects that are bringing some really awesome like green features and special things in units um, to help with energy efficiency. Um, but what we're seeing is that residents are like, I don't know what this is. Like, I don't, I, I need help understanding how to operate this or that there just needs to be resident onboarding and training. If there are special elements in your units that are unusual. Um, I think folks forget that, um, resident services folks involve your resident services folks to help do that. But, um, it's really important because we've, um, we've seen things not work properly because uh, households weren't trained properly on how to utilize the features. Um, and then the cost certifications and accounting review. So this is um, when your project, again, is kind of closing out. You've met stabilization and um, the accounting folks that are part of the, and we're talking tax credit typically uh, tax credit projects, that they're doing an accounting review to ensure that you're I'm not going to know if I, I don't know if I'm going to describe cost certs in a very elemental way, but it's like checking that all of your sources and uses were in alignment and your costs were what you said they were, right? Ish. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll chime in there that, you know, that's not uh, these days, not just uh, low income housing tax credits. Uh, what we've seen uh, to a lesser degree with the Portland housing bond, but to a, uh, a degree with the metro housing bonds as well, is that those bond sources, uh, there are certain costs that are and certain costs that are not eligible for those sources to pay for. So for example, th these cost certifications uh, and accounting documentation that we're talking about uh, is your accountants going through and saying, these metro housing bonds did not pay for the attorneys on the project, your construction loan paid for that, uh, because those were or were not eligible costs, and they need to be accounted for properly in order to meet, uh, for example, what the voters approved when the voters approved those metro housing bonds, uh, or what the federal income, uh, federal uh, income tax requirements are for the low income housing tax credit program. Hmm. See, better that you said that. Um, okay. And uh, so next slide, please. Um, and in our, pre in our last session, uh, session two, um, we had this slide up uh, and we're showing it again. This is essentially the, for a tax credit project. Um, this is the project timeline. So, um, there, and we talked about the pre-development period in our first session. Um, we're talking about, uh, and second, um, and then our, we're in construction and initial compliance period is what we're talking about now. Um, and then once you're hitting that 15 year, you hit that 15 year mark, um, in tax credit projects, we call that uh, year 15 exits, where you exit out of your partnership with the tax credit investor, and then you own the project outright, which is essentially called the extended use period. Um, so we're talking about that middle section right now um, and all that goes with it and all the all the players involved, um, all the expertise that's needed to understand all of those pieces. And there's a lot. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to actually talk about this in our next session too, but I felt like it was important to bring this up because if you were in the, our previous two sessions, you heard me sort of talking about asset and property management and services folks being involved from the beginning of a project. Um, there used to be this kind of terminology where we said, oh, okay, development's going to hand over the project to asset management. That still, that handover still kind of happens, but asset management really should be at the table from the very, very beginning. 
because as asset managers, we understand what the existing housing portfolio, how it operates, and we're going to know and be able to hopefully influence some decisions that are being made in the development of a new project to say, oh, wait, now we did that in this project and it was a terrible idea. Like we need to use a different whatever material, um, these windows didn't work well for our residents, that kind of thing. So so these are some examples of how asset management uh, should be involved in the different phases of development. So these are just, again, quick 101 examples. We could talk about one of these three for like an hour. So um, I'm gonna hit them really quickly. Um, Pre-development, you're talking about your property management company, the property management agreement, the property management fee, what all of that looks like. Property management is a whole other bag of tricks to talk about at another time. Uh, but if you want to talk about property management and the state of property management, there is a session on it. It was going to be today, but it's actually tomorrow morning. So if you're planning on going to that, it's going to hopefully be really great. Um the limited partnership agreement. So if you're in a tax credit partnership, you're going to be entering into a tax credit partnership with an investor, having an asset manager be able to weigh in on the different components of that limited partnership agreement. There are elements that asset management understands about an LPA and the things that are you, the hoops we have to jump through um, for being in a partnership with an investor. So it's important to have asset management input when you're negotiating a limited partnership agreement with an investor. Um, other regulatory agreements around the debt service coverage ratio, which we talked about um, already, reporting requirements, understanding, again, when you have all of these different sources, where is there conflict? Um, and if there is conflict as far as like whatever, the DSCRs are different uh, from different funders, there's time in pre-development to sort of create some alignment and asset management can knows what to look for to be able to help negotiate getting some of that stuff in alignment. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, capital reserve planning. This has gotten a little bit better over the years, but there are capital replacement reserves that every project ends up having set aside uh, for not the life of the project. It's never enough reserve. Um, but asset managers know, like we know at a, at a 10 year mark for this type of project, we're going to need to be able to access X number of reserves to cover the capital items that need to be replaced. Operations cannot cover the costs of those types of replacements. So it's really important for asset manager, asset managers to weigh in and say, if you can, you know, Make sure we get this much replacement reserve fronted at the beginning. That would really help the project in the long term. It's getting a little in the weeds. Sorry. I'm also kind of, I see people are getting really sleepy. Um, take a deep breath and take a drink of water. Um, okay. And then the lease up schedule. That is absolutely huge. There needs to be coordination with everyone because I cannot tell you how many times I've gotten a phone call from a client or a former client or a client who wants to be a client. And they're like, we have this schedule that we're supposed to hit for lease up. There's no way we can do it. Can you help? Uh, well, where, you know, where are you in the project? Oh, well, we're leasing now. <laughs> okay. Well, it's too late for that. I mean, we could try, but there's things that you can do on the front end where if you have an investor who's saying, we need you to lease 40 units in a month. That's, I mean, to me, the the highest you should go is 30, even if you have the best team in place. It's just, it's too risky um, because if you don't hit those benchmarks, that costs money. Um, so asset managers understand that and know what is realistic. So involve them when you're negotiating that lease up schedule. Okay. Construction, um, design for common areas, management office, storage units. We talked about this in the last session. It's really important to get asset management, property management and services folks to kind of weigh in on materials and where things are. There's a funny thing, rent drop boxes on here because uh, Liz, my colleague, talks about a project that she um, kind of weighed in on, but it was too late. There, there's no rent drop box. Like, where is that? We got to put that in somewhere. So it's those kinds of things that folks on the ground understand what is needed and know what's needed. But folks who are, there's a million things that you're juggling. So it's just important to 
get the folks who were actually managing the project to weigh in on things uh, during that construction period. Uh, security and cameras, finishes, lighting, HVAC, landscaping, uh, confirming unit numbers. That's Sounds like really obvious, but you'd be amazed. Like addresses, we've had some big issues with projects where it's like, we don't know the address of this project and the post office doesn't have us as an actual project. Like they don't have the address. So there's that kind of stuff that again, sort of just gets forgotten about. Um, Asset and property management is going to be thinking about that stuff. So involve them in those discussions. And then lease up, um, yes, please. So I'm just going to highlight a couple uh, mistakes I've made in my career uh, in the construction phase. Uh, d number one, with the with the idea of unit numbering or or project numbering, you know, oftentimes if you have an existing site, your asset or property manager may know what the address of that property used to be, but you went through permitting and the permitting bureau changed the address. Yeah. Uh, and now they need to know uh, where the mail needs to go. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely one thing. Um, calling out just in terms of the construction as well. I've made that rent Dropbox mistake uh, only once. <laughs> um, but also those things in construction we talked about uh, in, uh, Julie's talked about and we talked about in prior sessions, your ad back list. So it's working with your property and asset manager to understand what are those need to have things what are those want to have things and what are the things that don't really matter? Uh, and those things may change based on the population you're serving in an individual development. So it's making sure not just what was that conversation you had with somebody two years ago, um, but what's the conversation that you're having now as you're initiating this development about what did they learn from that project yeah. two years ago? but also what does it mean for the specific population in this property yeah. that's different than the population that was in the property that you developed last, because those answers may be different. Absolutely. Um, thanks for that. Uh, okay. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly uh, just because I don't want us to run out of time. Um, and there's still a bunch to cover. Um, but as I've already plugged the next session a bunch of times already, this is what we're talking about in the next session is the lease up. What happens with that during that period in like in deep. And we're going to be talking about a case study, um, that managed it brilliantly, um, and how we did it. Uh, so a lease up reserve, I mentioned this in our last session. Um, this is something that was around a little bit, uh, a few years ago, we're seeing it more now and it's more critical than ever to have, uh, development ensure that there is a lease up reserve. And the reason why is because you have, it does, it doesn't usually have a lot of strings attached to it. And you can use that money for additional marketing for additional staff during your lease up period. If you want to staff up, you can use it for training. You can use it for extra file review, uh, for tenant file review, um, an outside party to review those files, construction uh, overrun stuff or construction interest. Yeah. So you get really creative because it, there usually aren't uh, strings attached, but not every project has a lease up reserve. So I always like to point it out. Um, the lease up budget, uh, again, loaded, could talk about it all afternoon, um, talking about realistic budgeting um, versus no offense to developers, like the development performa and those numbers and like what is really happening and what's really going to happen during lease up and how much that's going to cost. Again, coordination, collaboration, um, reporting requirements during lease up. Lease up is an incredibly intense time. There are a million things happening. It's getting residents house, which is like your main mission, but there's all of these reporting requirements that you usually have to meet during that crazy lease up process. So talking about everyone understanding what those requirements are, who's doing what, who's sending this information to this person and that person. And it's a lot, again, a lot of coordination, uh, a rent analysis. Um, this is evaluating what your max, what I mentioned earlier, um, your maximum allowable rents for the set aside percentages on your project versus what is marketable. Are they the same? Can you rent your units at maximum allowable for that particular area? Things have changed a lot. And, um, a rent analysis tool helps you evaluate what that looks like. You keep that rent analysis going year over year and it helps you figure out rent increases, um, 
how and when to do rent increases and how much you can raise rents and all of that. So it's an important tool. And then compliance chart I already talked about, uh, which is the summary of all of the requirements in the project. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Typically, your limited partnership agreement outlines if there is a downward adjuster, which is what it's called when you don't hit the um, tax credit delivery schedule. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, typically, the LPA outlines how that adjuster is covered. Um, it specifies really clearly. Um, usually it's uh, from your developer fee, like it spells it out, but that is a negotiate. I mean, LPAs are agreements, they're negotiable. Um, there are some things you can't move, but that is something um, that could potentially be negotiated depending on your investor. Anything else to say about that? Yeah, uh, to KT's point, most typically what's gonna happen is you will, your, um, you'll receive less equity from your investor. So you have, now you have fewer sources than what you were counting on. If one of the things you were gonna do with that source was pay for your lease up reserve, you could reduce the size of your lease up reserve and then you wouldn't need it anymore. So effectively, yes, you can uh, if you don't need it. Yeah, okay. Um, next slide, please. Uh, okay. I'm yeah, I know I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta move. Uh, okay. So, uh, once lease up is complete, the owner's responsible for ensuring that the project, these, I mean, a lot of things, but in general, these three things meets compliance requirements. So again, the rent and income restrictions that all of the different funders are requiring, reporting to all of the funders, lenders, investors, everybody reporting quarterly, annually, um, sometimes monthly if you're not doing well, um, adequate insurance coverage, that's a compliance element, performs financially and as projected, that's a major ideal, um, but not always uh, possible. Your collect that rent is being collected. That sounds really obvious, but you'd be surprised. Um, monitor those payables, making sure that projects can actually pay their bills and meet the required debt service coverage ratio on a quarterly basis. I mean, ideally monthly, but you're reporting quarterly. Um, and then remains in good physical condition. Um, so ensuring that no, that there's no deferred maintenance, that things are actually being taken care of. It's fine the first couple of years, um, but you got to stay on top of it. Um, next slide. This is um, something really important that I want to point out. Uh, and if you're a nonprofit owner, there's also a third circle that involves resident services. But this is uh, basically defining the difference between property management and asset management. I get this question all the time. Like, what's the difference? 10 years ago, a lot of organizations didn't even have asset managers. It was just like, oh, property management does all that stuff. It's not the case anymore. Um, asset management is looking out for the project and the port housing portfolio for the long term. What's the 30,000 foot view? How are we planning things? What's, if things are operating this way now, how are they going to operate three years from now? What can we do if things are looking bad three years from now? It's, it's big, longer term planning. Property management is day-to-day -day operations on the ground, rent, rent collection, paying the bills, do, like managing the maintenance requests, all, all the day-to-day -day stuff. Asset management, again, prop, making sure the property is meeting its goals, the mission, reserves, all of all of the bigger long-term projects is what asset management is responsible for. If you ask any asset manager right now, they'll tell you that anywhere from 75 to 99% of their time is spent managing the property manager. Um, that's unfortunately just the way it is right now. Um, but ideally, you guys are working together uh, and asset management 
can hopefully get to that place where they're doing long-term planning. You've got areas of overlap where there's tenant relations, annual budgeting, where you guys work together, capital planning, public relations, crisis management, security. Those are all things where property management and asset, man asset management really work together on um, making sure those things are happening and collaborating on them. Okay, I'm talking fast. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, I'll do this one really fast too. Um, but obviously, if you have questions, please come up and, and talk to me afterwards. Um, generally, we look at owner oversight. Again, you're hiring property management to do the day-to-day -day stuff. But owner oversight falls essentially in four categories. You've got the compliance piece, financial, the operational piece, and the physical condition. Those are basically everything that an owner asset manager is responsible for typically falls into one of those four buckets. Buckets. There's also like resident, obviously resident relations and working with your resident services folks. But ideally, this is what an asset manager is responsible for overseeing. And you can see the examples of um, all of those different things under those categories. I, again, I could spend all day talking about just this slide. So um, I will, okay, next slide. Uh, okay, and um, so long-term, we, we did talk about this a little bit uh, in the first session, um, but successful long-term portfolio ownership, it's super, super important to set clear goals for your housing portfolio's mission, the financial performance, and the physical condition. We talked about how um, I've done a lot of board trainings in the last several years where where nonprofit boards are learning more about housing. What does it mean to own affordable housing? How do we as a governing body or board need to help advise and make sure our housing stays healthy? It's those four buckets, right? It's making sure that those things are staying uh, in compliance and we're on top of them. Um, requiring staff to set measurable indicators for all of these goals. There's a thing called the dashboard, a dashboard, which every asset manager in here knows what that is, but it's basically a summary of your portfolio's operations. Um, and it reports to the board how your housing is doing. Um, consider establishing an asset management committee to focus on portfolio performance and planning. The reason why I point that out is because boards uh, typically have a lot of varying experience. I've done trainings on uh, boards for housing organizations that have no housing people on them. Um, they don't know anything about housing. I mean, a little bit, like a realtor maybe is on the board, but like understanding the complexity of owning and operating affordable housing is really important. And having an asset management committee is a good way to do that. Um, invest in planning to ensure the portfolio's long-term sustainability. Um, it's just about planning, planning, coordination, um, all the things we've been talking about today. Uh, next slide. Um, Travis, do you want to take this one? Yeah. So as we as we wrap up for today, everybody's still awake. Okay. Good. As as we wrap up for today, we wanted to make sure to share a few resources. Uh, we've shared a wealth of information already, but where do you go to learn more? Where do you go to refresh yourself on what you learned today? Where do you go to keep up on what's changing? So a, a few options here. Uh, obviously, the first thing I'm going to call out is HDC's website and blog. Uh, we love to share out information, follow us on LinkedIn, um, love to share out information about what's changing, what's important, what we're seeing in the market. Uh, and so follow us along there. Uh, lots of great information. Katie already gave a shout out to the Property and Asset Management Working Group or POMWOG. I actually don't think it's that terrible of an acronym. I think of it as like a little polywog or something like cute happening. Um uh, and that's uh, that's pure sharing, learning, information, presenting uh, that's really about what's happening now, what's coming in the future, what's new, what's different, what do what do we need to have our eyes open to? What do you know that you what do you not know that you wish you'd known to ask? And there's a flyer on housing development centers table uh, out in the lobby. So feel free to grab one of those. Um Many of the folks who are in development uh, or perhaps asset management are already familiar with Nova Gratic, uh, who provides training and information, but also is one of the tax credit accountants that lots of folks use. 
Um, NeighborWorks uh, is another organization, uh, obviously, that has affiliate members across the country, or maybe, maybe, or maybe not, obviously, has affiliate members across the country doing housing development, ownership, service provision, um, but they also provide a lot of training um, and the Consortium for Housing and Asset Management. Anything that you'd like to say about that, Katie? Um, I would actually. So uh, for folks who are in asset management, you may know about CHAM, or maybe if you're not in asset management, you know about CHAM, but that's the Consortium for Housing and Asset Management. Um, and they are affiliate an affiliate of NeighborWorks. They provide the one and only asset management certification in affordable housing. Um, it's a nationally recognized certification. Um, I am excited to report that um, I will be facilitating the first Oregon cohort for the first three classes of the CHAM curriculum. So you have seven classes that you do to get your CHAM. The first three classes, you get a certificate called the Asset Management Specialist. And that's what I'll be um, facilitating starting in January 2024. There's a flyer on our table. We have limited spots. If you are interested in going through the uh, CHAM curriculum, you'll do three classes over a six month period online and meet with me and your cohort every month for six months. Um, so information on our table. I'd love to have you join limited spots. It's going to be awesome. I'm very excited. That's it. That's my point. And for the organizational leadership folks in the group here, I would call out in a prior role, uh, my asset manager went through not KT's version, um, but the CHAM certification also went through trainings with KT, which were incredibly valuable, but your asset manager will learn so many really valuable tools uh, about how to keep your portfolio and your housing operating the way that it should, or how to figure out what to do when it's not. So uh, super valuable. Uh, National Development Council is an organization that does housing development finance training, incredibly intensive in the weed stuff. Uh, I got my certification through them. Um, lots of smart people uh, doing training there. Enterprise Community Partners, uh, obviously, maybe not obviously, uh, is a low-income housing tax credit investor, uh, but they are also an organization that provides training, research, uh, and policy uh, information and work out in our community. Uh, and so has some great resources on their website uh, and um, some tax credit 101 information stuff on their YouTube channel and other things. And I'm certain that there are so many more other resources that we could have like created a whole word cloud on this slide, but so many more, these are just a few of them. And I think our next slide is for our Q&A. Uh, and so want to open that up to you all. I think we've got about 10 minutes left here, technically in the session. What uh, What do you want to know that we didn't get to yet? Or what do you want to share? Or what do you want to share? Yeah. 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 Oh, good. I just have a comment uh, from the oh, yeah. Yeah. Right around the microphone. Oh, thank you. Go ahead with my water over. Oh. Um, I just wanted to share one of the things from the architecture side is one of the items up there was um, security and um, low voltage stuff that tends to fall through the cracks if you don't pay attention to it very early in your design process because you need to have your contractor, your engineer, your architect, your asset management, your, you know, everybody at the table early. So I just want to put a plug in for that. Sounds great. I will second that. And I know Julie will, uh, having found some successes, but also making some mistakes there, uh, great opportunity to connect with your property manager and your asset manager to learn about lessons learned too. And I'll also say that those are, that's one of those many, many areas where it's always changing. And so you, even though you've done it one way in one project, it is going to be different in the next project. And that has to do with the project that you're serving, the utility that you're pulling in, the technology changes every single day. So many of these things, like uh, you have to continue having the conversation. And thank you for that. It's very, very important. Yes, yes, yes. Any other questions? Yes. So the question actually is for you. So 
you you broadly mentioned in the presentation about the resident services that is another area but i just want like if you can say a high level how does this interact or live together with the property management and asset management services because i would like just to sure. understand thank you yeah I mean, we have done like whole POMWOG sessions where we have had like resident services coordinators attend the meeting to kind of talk about that. It really is different for every organization just because different organizations have varying levels of involvement with their resident services coordinators. Um, and also your property management is every prop. If you have in-house property management, that'll be different because um, it's all in-house, right? Your resident services coordinators, your property management, everybody's in the same organization. So it really does vary. What I can say um, is that it's really important to have this kind of conversation where roles and responsibilities are defined for your organization. So say you get a new property management company, it's important to sit down and actually have that discussion around what it means, what your resident services coordinators are doing, what how they serve your mission, how they need to be involved in daily operations. Because unfortunately, there's just a, there's different missions where property management is all about I mean, they care about residents, of course, but it's like rent collection or resident services are like, we don't want our folks to not be able to pay their rent, but if they need help, we need to give them help. So there's just varying uh, goals. And so it's important to get on the same page, uh, but it's, there's not a one size fit all, fits all. That's kind of a lame answer, but it's just the truth. We have some we have some material, yeah, that we have um, helped folks develop over the years. So, so we can so we can send you some stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, sorry, I would also add. I, I've worked in housing and services, and a lot of um, did a lot of work with property managers, asset managers, and resident services. And one more layer is when you have permanent supportive housing or referring partners that are offering supportive services, ensuring that you're defining the role of that partner as well as it relates to the property and the resident services, because there's assumptions made um, on all sides of the equation. And oftentimes those assumptions lead to conflict um, or misunderstanding. Yeah, I thanks for bringing that up. I, I wasn't even talking about PSH because it's like such a different animal. Oh, we have another person. Oh, it's okay. Thanks. Yeah. I was just curious, um, we have worked on work for Beneficial State Bank, and we've looked at a few projects recently um, that are Lyft or other development projects where we are just using the developers pro forma for a lot of our underwriting, which you mentioned, especially in lease up can be a bit understated. So, um, and in a lot of those projects, it's clear that they don't have a property management company in place yet, or they know who they're going to use, but it I don't, I've never gotten the feeling that they're like collaborating on that pro forma together. Um, so I guess I have kind of two questions is one, how early do you typically see people looping in project management companies? Or if we are using a developer's pro forma, how much would you say it usually overshoots? Like the budget should maybe, how much cushion would you add to that to be realistic? Uh, no, that, uh, that's like a, yeah, like that's a, su no, 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 that, that's a super loaded question. And I wasn't, I wasn't like dogging on development performance. I'm just like talking about the way it is, like the, 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 the nature of things right now are really intense. Um, I, I hate to keep saying the next session, cause we are actually going to talk about that where we, where asset management uh, was working really closely with development on this project. That's going to be our case study that we're going to talk about um, where we actually did that discussion and had, we reviewed the development performa before the lease up started and sort of submitted a new operating budget to say like, we like at maybe a year before we started lease up, we were like, we saw that things were really off and we needed to shift uh, what we were doing. So it's kind of performa, budget and actuals. So it's like three. And then there's like a, 
nice sort of averaging that you have to try to do. That's not really answering the question. It's hard because I think every project is a little different. Yeah. I, I mean, I think ideally a property manager is on board immediately. That's ideal, right? Yeah. Because you want to get, it's one of the basic things you need to create a development performa is uh, how much, what are your expenses going to be? What's your revenue going to be? Yeah. How much debt can we service? If you're working with an organization that doesn't yet have a property management firm. So ideally you do all my property management. I'm building a building that has 43 bedroom units give me some comps for those 43. Yeah. If you don't have a property manager yet, you really have to be getting comps, good comps from somewhere. And the developer might be doing that. The developer might be like, oh yeah, I called XYZ and they got me comps, but well, make, that's making it up out of thin air. Yeah. And that's asset yeah. management's, asset management's role, right? Like that they're managing an existing portfolio. I mean, in most organizations. And so they're going to be able to provide that kind of information if your property management isn't online yet. Oh boy. Yeah. What are the, we on time? Yeah. The, the advice that, that I would give to you as a lender too, if you're looking at that is, uh, well, so number one, uh, whether you're a lender, whether you're a developer, whether you're an owner, uh, the thing that is most important on the next project is the thing that went most badly on the last project. <laughs> so, I mean, there's always that. You're going to be looking really closely at those line items that got blown out of the water. Um, but the other thing is, you know, uh, on the development side, uh, there's a little bit of art to it and a little bit of science to it. Uh, as developers, we're, we're never trying to pull the fleece over anybody's eyes. We're using the best information we have at the time, but we're imperfect too. We're not going to pencil out operating expenses that we'll never be able to achieve because we'll never make that uh, conversion <laughs> um, uh, milestone. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's absolutely appropriate to dig in and say, hey, where did you get these numbers from? And maybe it's a line by line thing, or maybe it's just based on um, particular things that feel like they could be pressure points, either based on the population or uh, or the environment at the moment. But it's like, you know, do you have a, do you have a bid from your trash hauler for this property in this location with this size, you know, unit mix? Uh, have you gotten pricing from your insurance provider for the insurance? Uh, have you, you know, does the um, maintenance and turnover expenses, you know, what are these based on? Was it the same type of construction? Was it the same type of population? So digging in with some of those probing questions is is absolutely appropriate. And as a developer, hopefully we've thought deeply through that and had those conversations with our property managers or gotten those comps. I mean, two years ago, we never would have thought that we'd be in this situation with operating expenses too. So it's not like developers didn't do a good job with that particular performance. It's just the world, the market and the world and expenses and all of it has shifted so much. I think from the bank perspective, we have to go in and check the water. Yeah. Feels like we're kind of sitting and looking for flaws. Hearing that really does scare me. Yeah, well, I wanted to respond to the sort of another piece of your question, which is when does property management come on? If there is state funding, I'm with OHCS in the production department. If there is state funding, a couple of years ago, we changed our process. We would ask for a full management agent plan right at the beginning. But what we realized is that so many times the management agent would change. And so that was sort of a waste of time for everybody right, involved. And so we, would, we were having to go and approve it a second time if they changed in the middle during construction. So now what we require is at 50% construction completion, that's when they put in the management agent packet and that's when we approve it. So they're coming on before the end. Right, are we past time? What time is it? You don't need anything? Right, anybody else? Oh, hi, Meg. I didn't even see you sitting there. Uh, maybe a little late, but I want to know. What is the, the strategy of the bank industry in regards to interest rate? Can we ask for a break? Yes. I mean, we talk about collaboration. We talk about working together. Show me the money. <laughs> I'm looking at you because you say you're a banker. But I hope Onkwa Bank is here too, Wells Fargo, everybody that have 
eating all our developer fee from a small nonprofits. I'm not talking about the big housing developers out there. I'm talking about small nonprofits. And I'm looking directly to your eyes because I need a response as an industry leader. I will not just shut up because communities of colors are the most affected ones. Sorry to bring this out, but we must talk about all the money that we have lost. It's not an organization that loses money. It's a community. It's that kid that we need to put at the school. It's that family that needs to buy a home so they don't rent and don't live in affordable housing. So equity equals money. Else? I think we're good. Thanks for hanging in there, you guys. Is the mic off?